Hello folks, I'm going to start this session. I think we're already live. I'm just going to speak for about 10, 15, 20 seconds to make sure that uh, the live session is going fine and get some feedback from you folks that the audio and video are fine or that you can, you can see and hear us very clearly and all the rest of it. Uh, and once that is done, we'll jump in and start. And so uh, I, I'm just waiting for some feedback from all of you on, on the chat window to say that uh, things are fine. I think we've started more or less on time. Uh, I'm, I'm just waiting. Uh, there's obviously a lag between when I speak and when the, you guys can hear on YouTube. Obviously, there's gonna that lag is going to flow through here. All is well. All is well. I think uh, I'm getting enough feedback saying that the technology battles have been won. And so we're going to start off on our first of our sessions, which are uh, which are the kind of college interaction session, P school interaction session. These are sponsored sessions. Uh, I think this is a very interesting idea that we have gone on to kind of explore. Uh, B schools are very keen to reach out to students. Students are very keen to uh, know about B schools and what what is seen in MBA program. Uh, and and we guys want to present one other type of content rather than saying, okay, how do you prepare for CAT? How do you do this? How do you do quant? Uh, and when we get our uh, when we get access to wonderful candidates like we have today, we will showcase them and then and then have a. Uh, uh, have a session discussing different things. Fine. So I'm going to tell you one thing straight away. I've interacted quite a few times with Mr. Tarunan during this uh, this course. Uh, make sure that you take value from the session. So um, I can tell you that uh, he he probably has a nice prepared script, but he's going to be even better when he's shooting from the hip. So ask him questions. All of you, many of you might harbor aspirations of being a CEO. He's been there, done that. His CV is fantastic. And so make sure that anything that you have in mind, uh, you articulate it clearly and, and don't let them get off here without answering all of them. Fine. Lovely. So I'm going to switch out to uh, Zoom and then go on to, uh, I'm going to introduce Mr. Taranandan. And Mr. Taranandan established Universal Business School in 2009, India's first uh, Green B School. It's based out of Mumbai. He has an MBA from SPGIMR, Mumbai, and he pursued executive education at uh, Michigan Business School. Tuck Business School in the US and IE Business School in Spain. And so he's got a glittering CV academically. He brought global best practices in management education to India through partnership with universities in UK, US, France, Spain, Italy, Switzerland, Mexico, and Bulgaria. At 35 years of age, he became the youngest chairman and managing director of Thomson Reuters, and so of Thomson Reuters South Asia, and director on the board of a achieving the highest growth rate across BRIC nations. Tarun co-founded and served as a global head of strategy and head of Asia Pacific at FX Market Space. He invented FX Settle, a revolutionary FX settlement solution, which was one, which has won several international innovation awards. He, he did this in 2008. In 2005, he was promoted to global head of treasury to run a $2 billion business across 136 countries. And he was invited by the Reuters Group CEO to Reut join the Reuters Innovation and Venture Board. He has worked for Thomson Reuters in London, New York, Hong Kong, and Mumbai. Okay. Mr. has over 25 years of experience in financial services, banking, exchanges, and education, including working for Standard Chartered and HSBC. He's a TEDx speaker and has spoken at leading industry conferences across North and South America, UK, Europe, Africa, and Asia. And so he was awarded the Education Evangelist of India by Great Place to Study in 2020 and selected as goodwill ambassador, global goodwill ambassador in 2018. And so this last piece is very interesting as well. He loves mountaineering and has scaled, scaled Mount Kilimanjaro and represented India in international rugby tournaments. And I'm definitely looking forward to asking questions on that. And so uh, once again, it's, it's, it's absolutely lovely to have you on board, sir. Uh, I, many thanks for accepting our invitation and having a go at this session. I'm going to hand over to you and, and listen to your journey in becoming a global CEO. Uh, his CV speaks for, for itself, but the wealth of experience you've had in seeing multiple countries and multiple challenges in one of the most intensely competitive sectors, I'm sure it will be a treat for us to listen to. So I'm going to hand over to him. And then at the end of it, we'll have a session completely on Q&A. So Take in whatever information you can and whatever questions you have, post them on YouTube. One of us will have a look on it and then bring it back to him. Over to you, sir. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Rajesh, for that lovely introduction. Uh, and it's great to be here on this amazing platform to IIM 
uh, you know, I'm pleased to know that you guys are the strivers of the future. And it's, it's you guys are the guys who are going to build uh, India and global companies uh, and be very successful. So uh, very delighted to be on such a wonderful platform. Uh, so I'm going to start by telling you a few stories because I believe that uh, the journey of mine, uh, I started my career uh, at the bottom and was able to break the glass ceiling. So how did that all happen? So some of the insights, some of the turning points is what I want to bring to you today. So, uh, you know, like most of you, I don't know if any of you from Mumbai, I grew up in Mumbai. I just worked very hard, long, hard days. I was in a equity research. I started my career in equity research. And I was in this four, uh, you know, we were a team of four uh, equity researchers working for one of the biggest equity research firms in the country. And uh, these three of them were I am Ahmedabad guys, and I was a BCOM, right? I was a nobody. We used to go into this room, and in that room uh, where we four used to operate out of, there were three chairs, and just me, one. One, three IAMs, me, one BCOM, right? What's going to happen? Obviously, the IAMs are going to take the three chairs because they're God's gift to mankind. Uh, and I was left, you know, standing. And I used to work the entire day either standing. And when I was tired, I would go on to my hunches. Sometimes I was so tired, I would sit on the floor. Uh, and so then I would go back in the local trains in Bombay. And some of you might know the local trains when they're packed. Of course, in today's world, they aren't. But in the real days, right? So I'd go in the local trains. I was dead tired. And I would say, you know what? My, I have to find a way to kill this because I was dead tired, right? eight, nine hours of standing, and then you go in the local trains where you won't get a seat. And I would go into the local trains, khade khade, and I found a way to deal with that 30-minute journey. And I said, khade khade so jana, right? So I would go, it goes kadak, 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 kadak. I wish I could be here in front of you. I would have shown you. And I would fall asleep. When I wake up, uh, you know, and you can't fall because you're packed like sardines, so you can't wake up. So I would look outside and see this guy in a Mercedes Benz and say, yeh, yeh Mercedes Benz mein koon hai? So my friend would say, you know, he must be a CEO. And that's the day I said, Mujhe bhi CEO banna hai. He said, eh, you know, you can't become a CEO. Aise aise CEO nahi bante. I said, why? I'll become a CEO. He said, no, for that, you need to get into a company, right? If you don't get a company job, how are you going to get a CEO, a top company and a top job? I said, uh, okay, tell me how. He said, you've got to get do your MBA before that because that's your journey into the corporate world because you don't have Tata Birla in your name. I said, okay, I'll do an MBA. And then he said, no, but you have to crack CAT. And I died because he told me CAT was finance and I was very weak at finance. Anyway, long story short, I got into CAT uh, SGEN and I was like thrilled. On the final day, on our graduation day, my dean, Dr. L. Srikant, one of the veterans of India's education sector, he said, who out of you, we were a batch of 120, who out of you will become a CEO of an Indian company in 10 years time? Challenge. I put up my hand. You know, I remember the days of the train and I said, I will become a CEO. But in 10 years time, I said, yes, challenge accepted. Guess what? 10 years passed. I took the challenge. 10 years passed. I failed. I did not become a CEO of an Indian company in 10 years time, but I became a global CEO in 12 years time. Chalega? I think chalega? Yeah, right? So I was running a $2 billion business, as Rajesh said, in 136 countries. Like it was just king on the king of the world, right? I was doing business with the Chinese, the Japanese, the Australians, the Southeast Asians, the Singaporeans, the Israelis, the Russians, the Eastern Europeans, the Americans, the Germans, the Brazilians, you name it. I had done business from South Africa to any part of the world, right? It was the best time of my life. I was just 32 years of, and I was a global CEO. I thought it got better. At 33 years, I was promoted to the board of a $40 billion corporation. When I went for my first board meeting, I entered. And, you know, all the guys were Goras and with white hair. And I entered as 33-year-old guy. I would, they were 20 years older than me. And they looked at me wondering, what am I doing here? And I looked at them wondering, what am I doing here? Right? It was a, it was a surreal moment. And I said, this is it, man. At 33, I'm running, a, I've broken the glass ceiling. I'm at the, on a board level. It got better. I was the youngest chairman and managing director at 35 years of old, which you all heard. But the journey didn't start like this. I started my career as friends as a door-to-door -door salesperson. 
And that's what I'm going to tell you about the journey of how do you become from a door to door salesperson all the way to a global CEO, right? That's what you're going to hear in the next 20 minutes. I'm going to tell you three or odd stories. So I started in Bombay as a door to door salesperson. I was working for HSBC. I'm sure you know Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, right? I used to go knocking on doors. We were in Breach Candy, which is a posh area. Now there's no point going and knocking doors at 10 or 11 in the morning because you know what? Bombay is a professional city. Both husband and wife go to work. So the only time you can ring a bell and get the decision maker is to start ringing bells at six in the morning. Now, how happy will your mother be if I maro your ghanti at baje, six in the morning? Not too happy, right? Now, before you even entered the building, right? In those days, luckily there was no security like it is today. There used to be boards outside a building saying dogs and salesmen aren't allowed. So pehle you have to ka level de diya, right? You're a dog. Finally, you find a way in. That was another big deal. I won't tell you today, but that's another story. I'd knock the door at six in the morning, ding dong. And the mother of the house would open with her eyes like groggy. She's just been woken up. She's irritated. And I'm like, good morning, ma'am. I'm from HSBC. Har! The door would slam on my face. It was very like unconcerting, right? Disconcerting. So then I would ring the next bell. Thar, good morning. Thar, good morning. Thar. I would get beaten. I mean, the door would slam on my face. I was depressed, upset. How do I crack this situation? Because if I don't get a sale, I'm, I'm going to get fired, right? Because my boss wants, but nobody is even giving me two seconds. So I came up with an idea. I'm going to share this idea on the one condition when you go back home, I can't even say because you're at home, please don't tell your mothers this idea. Okay, promise me that. So imagine you're the mother at six in the morning, someone rings the bell, you open the door and I'm standing there, good morning, ma'am, I'm from HSBC. I would ring the bell and the door would open. Good morning, ma'am. And I know what's going to happen. The door is going to slam on my face. So you know what I did? I took a leap. When I know the mother is about to shut the door, I put my foot inside the door. Now she's obviously not looking. She's in a, in a sleep. The door would hit my foot and I'd go dar, 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 falling. And then I'd get up and say, ah, ah, I think I've hurt myself. Now she's wondering what happened, what, what just transpired, right? She's, she's wondering, she's caused it. So I'm like, ma'am, I, I, I think I've just hurt myself. I was just about to go. Can I just have a painkiller? Now, usne dar diya to dawa to deni hai, right? She's, she's caused me pain. So she's feeling like, you know, poor guy because of me, possibly he's got hurt. So she goes to the uh, wherever in the house, gets a painkiller and a glass of water. I would take that painkiller and about to drink the water. And I'm like, ma'am, I've just forgotten. I've not had any breakfast today. I'm not asking for a double cheese omelet with French fries and toast. All I'm asking is for a cup of chai. Chota, matlab, because every mother knows that you don't do it Right? All the mothers will tell you that. So she's committed to this kind of actions to follow so she makes chai for five minutes, five, seven minutes. I take five, seven minutes to drink. It's 15 minutes. What then? <laughs> Sale done. I wasn't getting two seconds. Suddenly I got a bonanza of 15 minutes. I made my pitch. I got a sale. Then it was Ganti fall, painkiller chai sale. Ganti fall, painkiller chai sale. Ganti fall, painkiller chai sale. One shot, six painkillers. Suddenly the, you know, some people must be thinking Pagal Sadar hai. But that's the way you do it, right? Now, why am I telling you the story? In life, there are going to be doors that are going to slam on your face. It could be the door of a, a job. It could be a door of a dream company. It could be a door of a business school. That's okay. Either find a way through the door or there's always another door. There's always another option in life. We don't have to give up in life, right? I'm a sports person. The beauty of sports is when you play cricket you lose a match of cricket do you say i'm never going to play cricket again no you say okay i've got to figure out whether my batting bowling fielding what needs to be improved that's what sports plays a big important part and what is this concept of bouncing back it's called resilience so the fundamental thing if you want to be a global ceo is the ability to be able to bounce back the ability to have the resilience right and if you don't have that you're not ceo material Right? So that's the first and foremost uh, thing I'd like to share with you. Build resilience in yourself. Now, number two, smash. Uh, number two is taking risks. Can you guys see the slide? I just wanted to share a slide with you. Uh, taking of risks. Now, how many of you take risks in your life? Right? How many of you take risks in your life? 
Now, if I were in front of you, I would have got a 50, maximum 60%. I've spoken about this all over the world and I don't get more than 60%. Now, why don't people take risks? People don't take risks because of the concept called fear of failure. What if I fail? I take a risk and I fail. What will happen? What will my, um, you know, what will my, India has big families, right? My kaka, kaki, cha, 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 chi, ama, ama, ama. Everybody say, oh my God, this, you know, he or she has made a mistake by taking a decision. I'm standing in front of as one of the youngest global CEOs for one and only one risk, one and only one reason, because I have taken a million risks in my life and failed a million times. Wait a minute. You just told us two minutes ago or five minutes ago, you had this super duper success story of becoming a global CEO at 33 or 32. And now you're saying you have multiple failures. This equation doesn't either your super duper failure or super duper success. Let me answer that question with an equation because you guys are going for cat. You love equations, right? When I risk, I fail, I learn. The person who doesn't take any risks has zero failures, zero learning. In this VUCA world, right? The volatile, uncertain, complex world and ambiguous world that we both are in because of COVID, the only way to survive is by accelerated learning not by staying safe. Staying safe, die, right? That's what companies do. If they play safe, you die. If individuals play safe, you die. You want to keep learning. The beauty of taking risk is this. If you take a risk and it wins, great. If you take a risk and it loses, you learn. So you're accelerating your learning. So it's a win-win strategy, yet people don't take risk. So my objective for you today is that after you listen to me, you start taking more risks because if you're not willing to do that, you're not meant for global CEO position. Now, everybody beats a deadline. I'm going to tell you a quick story. I was in London. My boss was a Britisher called Mark Robson. I uh, had an opportunity to, uh, you know, global management team. We used to meet every quarter to discuss corporate results and we used to discuss strategies. So my team was two Britishers, two Americans, one uh, French, one German, one uh, Japanese, one Chinese, one Australian, one Brazilian, and me as an Indian. We were part of this global strategic team. One idea one, uh, on one such quarter was that we need to acquire a $25 million company uh, based out of uh, Frankfurt, Germany. So before we said, we all agreed, it makes sense. It's got the technology and we were in financial markets. So we said, yeah. My boss said, no, before we go into this acquisition, we need to do due diligence. I hope you know what's due diligence. It's very simple. Due diligence is a process. When your father buys a car, he looks at all the models. He looks at the pluses and the minuses of the car, the cost, the ROI, and all of that. Similarly, when one company buys another company, you look at the balance sheet, you look at the cost, you look at the uh, people you're acquiring, the technology, and the products, and or the servicing, and the uh, you know, the, the, what we call the synergies. So when, if I have one car and you have one, if I buy one car, I get two cars, right? But due diligence is very different. If one company is acquiring the other company, you need to have uh, the, the ROI should be three, not two, right? Because two companies coming together should be able to multiply the value of the company. So that's a quick thing on due diligence. So my boss said, we need to do due diligence. My good friend, Heiko Kassens from Germany, uh, Heiko is a hardcore Germany, German from Dusseldorf. He puts up his hand. He said, I'd like to do due diligence. How long will you take, Heiko? So Heiko said, you know, uh, I think we'll take uh, two uh, months. Okay, Heiko, my boss, Mark said. So uh, my good friend, my Michael McCorkle from New York, he's an American. Americans always like to get under the skins of the Germans since World War right, II. So, so uh, Michael says, I'd like to do the due diligence. My boss asks him, how long will you take, Michael? He says, one month, right? So now the German's damn frustrated because so the German's like, no, no, we need this kind of strategy. We need to do dig deep and we need to do this analysis. And the American like, we gotta go fast, fast, right? We gotta go fast. So they were arguing with each other. I put up my hand. Guess what? My boss called me and I, my name is Tarun Anand, but in London, I was called Tarun, right? Uh, so, Taryn, what do you say? I said, Mark, I'd like to do the due diligence. How long will it take you, Taryn? By the way, I was called Taryn in London. I was called Taroon in New York. When I moved to Hong Kong, I was, I can't even tell you what I was called. It was a disaster, right? The Hong Kong, the Chinese messed up my name. I can't even tell you what it was. 
So Taron, what do you say? I said, I will take two weeks. So the German and American who are arguing with each other, they bounce onto me. You don't know anything. You've come from India. You have no experience about European markets. You're going to screw up this deal. I was like, oh, my boss entered and said, no, let Taron do it. Right? So I said, okay, guess what? First flight I could find to Frankfurt that same day I flew to Frankfurt. When I landed Frank in Frankfurt, what was my thought? I have never done due diligence in my life. Right? So back against my wall, I had to do nothing else but work like never I have worked before, 20 hour days for two weeks. And finally, I give my report to my boss, right? He's looking at it and he's like, but it's got a mistake. And I said, Gaib has pani me. I'm going to get fired. But he completed the report and he said, but it's got enough for us to take it to financial due diligence and uh, do NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, and we'll get into the sale process. I was like, wow, I breathe the Americans, the Germans, and I was on top of the world. I forgot about that story. Six months later, I get a call from my boss. My boss says, Taryn, come and have dinner with me. I'm like, okay, my boss was based out of New York. I was in London. My boss must have flown to London and we'll have dinner in Chelsea at his favorite restaurant. But I realized that day from my secretary that the dinner is in New York. Here I'm sitting in London. My dinner is in New York. What do I do? I run from uh, Canary Wharf in London. Uh, run to Heathrow Airport, buy myself a suit because I don't know what's the occasion, fly business class to New York, John F. Kennedy, shower, get ready, get, get to the dinner at 7 p.m. In the dinner, my dosso, boss opens a bottle of Don Perignon champagne, right? One of the most expensive in the world. And he says, congratulations, Taryn. You're the new global CEO of the treasury business. I was like, wow. You know, laddu putre the. I was just 32 years of age. I am global CEO in 132 countries. You know what is the first thing that came to my mind? But I couldn't tell him because he's a Gora, right? It was just one of those surreal moments. So I said, why me? Why did you choose me? Because all my colleagues, remember the Brits, the Germans, the French? They were all friends between 15 to 20 years older than me. They were from Howard, Wharton, Stanford, Oxford, Cambridge. I was from SPGN. SPGen is awesome here. Nobody's heard of SPGen in London and New York. So why me? Because I was way below in the pecking order. Yet I got to go above them and manage the entire people who were 20 years older than me. Why me? My boss said, because you know how to smash the deadline. I said, what do you mean? He said, if you hadn't in the due diligence process, put up your hand for a two week due diligence, we would have lost a $25 million asset. I said, I don't understand because our competitor, Bloomberg, had already put in a bid. And if you hadn't put in your week, we would have lost a, a massive asset, which would give us a competitive advantage. That's what I'm looking for in a global CEO. My life changed overnight. This was the most unbelievable event in my life. I was just like blown away. Then my boss says, but for this job, you need to move to New York. I was like very happy. I was living in you know Hyde Park right? Bang opposite Hyde Park with the Kensington Palace uh, next to me. He's like, move to New York. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm very pleased. He said, no, I have made the deal special for you. I have booked a penthouse apartment for you in New York's Times Square. I was like blown away. Penthouse apartment? He said, yeah, with downtown New York, literally, I had downtown New York, Empire State on my left, Hudson Bay flowing right there with them, Interpret and uh, Queen Elizabeth Park. It was just unreal. Only uh, Hollywood stars have penthouse apartments in New York's Times Square. I was in Times Square, right? Life-changing, right? So how does that happen? And then I'll tell you the fun part. Then I decided I want to move to Hong Kong. There's a story around this, but my boss makes it great. He's like, I'll give you a, a gorgeous apartment overlooking Harbor, uh, Hong Kong Harbor, and there are two swimming pools. I'm like, I need one swimming pool. He said, one in case you get bored. You know, that's the life. When you smash deadlines, the world will throw the uh, carpet at you. And you just don't even have to ask. It will come to you. The final story I have for you is how do you, uh, how many of you want a BMW? If you, in front of you, I would assume at least 60, 70% would say, I would like a BMW. Am I right, guys? 50, 60% would say they would like a BMW, right? Now, if you want a BMW, friends, don't be a BMW. If you want a BMW, don't be a BMW. What does that mean? Don't ever, ever, ever get into bitching, 
moaning and wailing. BMW, bitching, moaning, wailing. There'll always be people around you who'll always crib. Ye thik nahi hai, wo thik nahi hai. Boss thik nahi hai. Company thik nahi hai. College thik nahi hai. Narendra Modi thik nahi hai. Stay away from them. They are poison. The guys who are always bitching, moaning, that's the, they are the crabs. They'll get you down, right? So stay away from them. If you want to get out, I'll give you a very quick story. I was joined uh, this company. This guy put his hand around me and first day, he said, Chal chai pe jate. I said, Chalo. He said, why did you join the company? I said, I've heard here pe bahut zada incentive milta hai. He said, main ya paan saal se hoon, ya incentive nahi milta. I was shocked. You know, first day you join a company, you're like unsettled. In four years time, I made 40 lakhs of incentive. Right, so, so I'm just saying, stay away from these guys. Be from, be with the eagles who want to fly. And if you have people around you, next time someone comes with negative talk to you, you know what you say? BMW. He's like, where, where? You say you, right? And walk away. That's the only thing. You need positivity in your life. Now, there's one more thing I just like to share, and then we'll open it to Q A. You can see this picture of me with one of the legends of India, Mr. Ratan Tata. I was privileged to do business with him and I made a pitch. Do you know what's a pitch? You guys are going into business schools. You need to have an awesome, unbelievable, fantastic, sexy pitch. If you don't have a pitch, work on it. You'll crack the cat. What happens after cat? You have to have an amazing story to tell. Imagine you're in a lift. It's called, this concept is called an elevator pitch. Imagine you're in a lift. In that lift, there is uh, Sundar Pichai, uh, tell me something about yourself. Don't start by saying, I went to XYZ college, I went to XYZ school, I came from Lucknow or Karnataka. Nobody's interested in that. That's in your CV. You need to have something that can blow their mind, right? So develop an amazing pitch that can really like wow you. And there are several types of pitches, and we can talk about that in the QA if you're interested. So I, I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, and I'd love to have an interactive session where you can throw questions at me. So this is uh, snippets of my journey. I'm going to start again, just a quick recap. Resilience, if you want to be a global CEO, resilience, right? Ability to bounce back. Second, take risks. If you're not a risk taker, you're not CEO material. Third, smash the deadline. Anybody gives you a deadline, smash it, right? Fourth, don't be a BMW, right? Don't ever be a BMW. And fifth, develop an amazing pitch. Your world can change if you have an amazing pitch. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I can keep talking about many stories in my journey, but I'd love to hear from you. Uh, over to you, Rajesh. Oh, wonderful, sir. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful listening to you. Uh, the, the, the story format also worked wonderfully well. It's, uh, it's, uh, I, I really like the, the, the resilient part and the fact that you could uh, make a pitch and an impact. I think I have quite a lot to learn. <laughs> I think our, uh, uh, the, the stereotype uh, the, that, that work, which is, uh, I'm, I'm South Indian, so I'm naturally, I'm not going to go out there and say I'll smash your business, <laughs> which is, uh, that attitude has not served me well on occasions. So I should be, we take a, I take a lot of risk when we're building content, when you're doing something, but not quite as much when you're, when I'm putting myself out there. So uh, thanks a lot for that. I shall definitely strive to take more risk. And so it was wonderful having that session. Uh, I think we're going to uh, switch over to some questions from the, from the panel. I mean, I'll have a look at that, but I want to ask one question. I think one part of the story where uh, you, 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 you were, you had it all and your story is very clear. You were, you were a, been a raging success in, in your corporate career. But at some point, you went and started a school. Now, I'm a big fan. Anybody who goes and does something with the education sector automatically has my approval. But uh, what is the motivating factor? What made you switch out and say, okay, let me, now, now, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start teaching or I'm going to start up a, a school? What, what is the driver for that? Great. So, you know, I think everybody has a bucket list, right? You, you have things you want to achieve in your life. So I had my bucket list, like every one of you aspiring students, Unfortunately for me, I achieved it way beyond I had ever in my dreams and imagined, right? At 32, to be a global CEO, you don't even have it in your bucket list, right? People say, if pe banenge, uh, global CEO, right? Flying business class, 
whining, dining, and more than I've worked in countries around the world, right? 54 to be precise, or maybe 55. So I had done my bucket list too fast. And then I, uh, I think uh, my, my blood, both my parents happen to be educators. Uh, both have taught for three, four decades each. So I think somewhere there might be that. Uh, but I wanted to give back because I learned it the hard way of coming from you know nothing, literally nothing to top of the corporate world. So I thought maybe I can create CEOs. So my dream was to create CEOs. And that is what led me uh, to create a business school. I could have got into K-12, right? Education or some other form of education. I said, where can I create CEOs? Where can I share the values that I have learned, uh, the, the struggles that I've been through and tell people, this is the way. It's, it's, it's a pattern. If you crack that pattern, you can crack the model. But many people have this in their mindset. It's not possible. How can I do it? Uh, and I tell every student, you can become a CEO. True, true. Belief can do wonders. Sometimes uh, uh, we underestimate the role uh, belief plays. Many, many thanks for that. I think I'm just looking at the question. The most uh, common question is on, on, the, on the pitches, on the, on the elevator pitch. So they want to know how to come up with a pitch. And maybe you could throw a couple of examples of a, of a, of a high quality two minute pitch. I'm getting only two minutes with the, with the CEO. What do I convey in that window? What am I looking for? Okay, so there could be um, four types of pitches. One could be a pitch on your experience. One could be on your extracurricular. If you've done something outstanding, like, you know, my pitch was rugby, right? I played rugby for uh, India. So that's a pitch. I was a mountaineer, right? Those could be areas of the pitch or elements of the pitch. Uh, they could be around your work experience. They could be pitches. Sometimes you're like, okay, I've not done these two. Now what? I don't have any content. I've not done anything in my graduation. Then these are called futuristic pitches that I want to get there. I want to get to X place. Now, if I want to become a CEO, these are, you, you know, you need to research very hard on what you are um, doing, right? Uh, so if you say, I want to be a CEO of this company, say, I'm going to do this, this level, then I'm going to do these many years, then I'm going to acquire these kinds of skill sets, then I'm going to do, so it's a forward career oriented pitch. Then there could be a pure content pitch, like saying, you know what, I am fed up with corruption in India. It's like a provocative thing. I have an amazing way that I'm going to kill the corruption. This is what I'm going to do. This is going to, so it's got to be something which the guy will say, wow, this guy's really thought through his life, right? Now, um, we at UBS, we, uh, you know, just giving you one, one, one cent, uh, cent. So if you're going into the financial markets, right? Um, my students go to a global trading program, right? They, they trade uh, $10 million in global cross assets, right? Across five continents. So I'll tell you the pitch my student used and he killed it. Uh, he just said, you know, so the guys asked him, uh, tell me something about global markets. In fact, he wasn't asked a question about, uh, you know, tell me something about yourself. He was asked a Teda question, tell me something about global markets, tell me something about international trade and so on and so forth. You know how he answered it? He just answered it, you know, I was given $10 million by UB, Universal Business School. I put $4 million in the Brazilian economy. As the Brazilian economy stank, I took that $4 million out. I put a million dollars in the Japanese yen because Shinzo Abe, the prime minister of Japan, started raising interest rates. I put a million dollars in the commodity markets in Australia because of inter-commodity boom between China and Australia. I put a million dollars in the e-commerce stocks like Baidu and Alibaba because they were competing with Amazon and Google. And with the final $1 million, I hammered the Indian rupee against the US dollar because the Indian government could not manage its current account debt. Now that's a pitch, right? shock and awe. That's what a master has to talk. You have to change the language. You need to talk something which the guy looks at you and say, you did that in your business school? I haven't done it in my life. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thanks. I, I'm, uh, my professor used to say, whenever we made presentations, he'd say, look, you guys are building a case and it, you take so long with building a case that I'm bored by the time I come to the end of it. He used to be ruthless. But it was uh, good sound advice. And then I've listened to 10 presentations on corporate strategy and not one of you came up with this and started by saying, these are my three rec recommendations. This is, a this is what your company should do. Now I'll tell you why you should do that. 
said flip the scenario get to the most impactful thing right up front and then build the build the case case later uh, i it, 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 it was an eye opener in the sense that you have we are so conditioned to saying that this is my analysis and this is what i come to that we we forget that we lose the attention of the of the of the listener there's one other very interesting question said sir you mentioned this couple of times you said uh, you take risks and you face failures you said failure failing as a part of the risk taking journey one without the other is unimaginable you can't take risk and assume you're going to have a have a hit rate i think it's uh, from from my talk you said when you have those failures uh, who do you who do you bounce ideas with who's your uh, mentor or or what is your uh, what is your mechanism to pick yourself up great a uh, fantastic question so you know uh, obviously failure hurts no doubt about it right and if you're an achiever it hurts so i i get that so you've got to find an exit and my exit to deal with that failure per se just that failure uh is that i i for me it's sports right the moment i get onto a tennis court that's it i all i'm interested in hitting that ball or having that volley or that smash or that service i have just forgotten about my past right so either it's a sport either it's you know chilling with friends you want to see a movie you want to be uh, you know go to your loved ones just take yourself out of that situation so you can you know let it because everything yeah people lose lives unfortunately everything the human being is such a fascinating thing that everything we can digest it just requires some time some people require some more time some less so just find a way to get that time to to zone out as such and then get back to the board right saying okay what did i do right wrong and then go into the analysis and by the way you got to read a lot of books so uh, i i didn't have too much of a mentor my father was a mentor but uh, i i relied on a, a like a galaxy of books and you know that that really helped in imbibing you know what a elon musk thinks like what a jack ma of alibaba thinks like what a um, uh, you know uh, all the greats i mean i can't go on there are from nike or phil smith or uh, there are just so many of them i've read lee iacocca of um, chrysler so i must have read over uh, you know 50 autobiographies and each of them so people say who do you look up to i'm like you know all of them wonderful 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 thanks a lot i uh, i've i've been recounting kind of just opposing my own experiences uh, in all the pitches that you have said i think i would have been a content pitch guy not a not an idea or a dream pitch guy so i would be the kind of the the polar opposite when you're you're the person who says look i can do this give it to me i'll be the guy who says if they call me maybe i'll give it a shot <laughs> so uh, the, but the one thing i find enormous uh, found enormous common ground is sport and my my go to place for picking myself up is usually sport i like playing and i like watching as well so Uh, so i think that that sport has a place to de stress is uh, heavily underestimated we think it is we, we we get caught in our daily lives and we need to switch off and switch on back and i love the idea where you said look i i go back and switch off of this and then go get and get myself involved in, in sport and i can come back but my next question this is my own question so i want you to just give us a view of your uh, your mountaineering of course rugby is wonderful as a sport but mountaineering is, 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 is one other level so how was the experience and what is the what is the plan how do you go about it and when did this happen oh this was as a child i was part of the duke of edinburgh award scheme so i did a lot of peaks in maharashtra in the western ghats uh, and loved every moment of being out there in the wilderness in fact funnily enough it always happened in and around my birthday and i wouldn't even remember my birthday right and those days we didn't have mobile phones so you were completely incommunicado and it just didn't matter because i was in in the nature so i think uh i have the saying which is a, a fun thing great things are done when men and mountains meet this is not done by walking on the street uh so kilimanjaro was the most tough one i've done and mount kanchenjunga base camp but kilimanjaro was uh tough it was really tough i mean it's not that tough generally i thought i was you know uh i went from london to um, uh, tanzania i flew there and i was uh like feeling like i'm i'm rock star and i thought i could hit myself on the mountain i was really surprised i got on top with crutches okay. i got on top with crutches and i came down uh after i broke my entire thigh bone so it was not uh, not pleasant okay but uh, my dream is now to prepare and this year actually in march i booked 
myself for Basecamp Everest because my dream is to scale Everest. Uh, so I booked uh, it, but then COVID happened and that's the end of it. So maybe early next year, I hope I can make my first attempt on Everest. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. We would love to, maybe we'll have you again after a while to, to give you give us an update about your, uh, your, your Everest test as well. One other question just come up was, um, uh, it's, it's, it's not particularly relevant to what you've spoken of, but I thought it was an interesting uh, takeaway, interesting point to explore. How, how do you maintain a, a work-life balance? And so very often, you're, you're a CEO. You've talked about pushing yourself to the hilt. You've talked about smashing deadlines. You've talked about taking up a challenge and putting up your hand and saying, hey, I'm going to do this. That obviously means that that spell work consumes you. But over a longer term, probably we need to have one sense of work-life uh, balance as well. So how, what is your mechanism for that or what should youngsters think about forget even your mechanism but what should what should an aspirant how does how should they think about the idea of work life balance there should be should there be no work life balance in the first four years or should we yeah, talk about it as well yeah so for me it was just grind it out right i didn't think of for work for me was love love at first sight i enjoyed it there were times there were pathetic bosses who used to abuse me with all the abuses you know and more morning evening night and i was just like okay this is a game i'm going to learn this game so honestly for me uh i i'm not the best poster child for work life because i worked so hard and in london it was um, unbelievable um you know i love the brits why because they would go at 4 p.m to have their uh, beers and i would work till eight and i would come on the weekend and work and i think uh, you know, my throughput was 50% more than them. That's why I got the position. One of the reasons I got the position. So I think in the early part of your life, it's like this, right? When you're young, uh, you you just don't study, right? The first 10 years of your life, you just play, 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 play. You find every way to play. And then the next 10 years of your life, you study, study, study. So I think in the work also, something like that, the first 10 years, you just work here. Yeah, just give it your all. So there are two options my, my dad told me in my life. The first 10 years, you work your butt off and party for the rest 30. Or party for the first 10 and work for the rest 30. So I thought that, you know what? I like this first thing. And when you're older, you can't probably work. Although I have to say, I love my work even today. I love the fact I'm with students. We have something, uh, just sorry, if I may say so, we have something called Midnight Sunrise. It's a, we start the party on our campus at 12 midnight and it's at 6 a.m., right? We party till the sun comes around. And I'm the first guy on the dance floor and I'm the last guy on the dance floor. I mean, and there are 400 kids who are 20 years younger to me, but uh, there are only 10 kids left. So I work hard and I party harder. So he's not the poster child for uh, work-life balance, but he's made a very interesting point. He's saying, look, uh, you, you you create your balance across decades. And say, uh, there are times when you put your career first. And an early part of your career, you need to earn your stripes. You need to be the guy who is respected in your, in your offices and the guy the boss looks to when he, when he needs something. There's a certain kick to it, a certain thrill to it. Uh, wonderful. One other question, which again, what I thought was very interesting. He said, uh, should I uh, build hard skills or should I focus on soft skills and know whom to tap for hard skills? I know he's the Excel guy. He's the valuation guy. He's the derivative pricing guy. I have a good relationship with them. I know how to shoot the breeze. I can get my hard skills from outside and I'll be the soft skills person. Is that a viable strategy or should I build hard skills? So, from, you from know, the I, go? I think, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, should I eat or drink? Right? You've got to do both. You can't say I'm going to eat and not drink and vice versa. So I think uh, but but having said that, companies hire you for three things, right? Knowledge, um, uh, skills, which is what which we were talking about, and attitude. So I think uh, uh, all three are important. Knowledge is coming lesser because Google gives it all. Mm -hmm. Skills, of course, uh, now people look at hard skills as hygiene. If you want Earlier, hard skills was the differentiator. Now, hard skills is a hygiene. It's moved from a differentiator to a hygiene. Now, people are looking at soft skills because you're dealing with very complex, ambiguous, and, and tough uh, situations where you need, you need resilience and adaptability and agility, right? So, skills, soft skill is going to help. But attitude, guys, attitude is it. If you can kill that, that you can't fake. 
it can be it'll come out like this in the workplace so the way you you deal with your your superiors your colleagues attitude so i used to be the guy many people would tell me in my early start of my career even today uh ye karna you know do this and many people i would see around me saying this is not my job this is not my job and i was like wait a minute i want to be ceo right and as ceo i have to do everything i mean i'm responsible for everything so there was never a time i said no i said i'll do it so i was the guy who put his hand up always and that's what made me what i am today so if you want to get to the top see it they, you'll get great careers i'm sure but if you want to beat that top guy you got to say okay I, you know bring it on right right wonderful again i like the fact that uh, he made very clear distinctions and hard skills are the hygiene factor and very often i find students focusing on soft skills which is brilliant crucial it will take you places but you can't get by without understanding the, the basics of uh, the nature of what you're doing you can't just be a by a soft skills person so make sure that your skill sets that are can be measured and a tangible are in place then build a relationship and attitude to there's there's no there's no compromise on that and so uh one other question what would you do when your best efforts you smash ceiling after ceiling after ceiling what happens when your best efforts are not recognized by your boss what do you go through and what's your uh, coping mechanism i can call that uh you know work harder you keep working harder and you either make him wow so the guy who abused me um you know this was at standard chartered bank one of my old uh, in in the late 90s uh i worked so hard that the guy used to eat out of my hand and then when i became ceo of thomson reuters south asia he called me up and say can you get my son an internship and i was like absolutely right so even those th- okay so back to 1991 when i was working with those three iam guys right they were god's gift to mankind as i said they were smart as hell i was nothing i was a nobody uh they wouldn't even allow me to sit right on their chairs Six months. Read this book. Um, beware! No, um, swim with the sharks without being eaten alive. I read that book. In six to nine months, they were eating out of my hand. So even the most tough bunch, and that's where the soft skills play the role, right? You play the game. It's a game. You play the game. You get them on your side and rock it. And if he's an obnoxious boss, leave the damn company. Correct. 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 I I heard this phrase from one of those uh, one of the authors in core. I said we always talk about a flight or fight response, but apparently the professor used to say there's a flight, fight, and finesse. Don't fight, don't run, but 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 make sure that you you do 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 make your point. One of the questions I thought was very interesting. Find some. Are we entering a growth trap in India for a compelling long term career? Should we look abroad? You know, I, I was one of those guys who never wanted to go abroad. right i had no 0.0% attention to even study abroad i i have now studied in top schools i have worked in so many countries so i would say yes right uh, it's a great uh, i've learned tons from working with all these various cultures and navigating across the globe so if you get an opportunity great it's going to be less opportunities because the west is going through a tougher time in terms of uh, you know uh, economics uh, the 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 economic growth but if you can definitely look an opp- it's great opportunity but if you had come to me when i was your age i would have said no but the <laughs> world changed so i'm changed wonderful wonderful so if you have a shot at it if you have a chance pick up international experience that's your that's your advice absolutely one more very interesting question wonderful question i'm 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 uh, early part of my career should i go for a, a a uh, young startup a growing startup or an established brand name so i my first company was a startup uh, the value of a startup is that uh, you know uh, for me it was luckily after my spjmr i started with a startup i reported directly to the ceo and it was such a fluid thing that i had four responsibilities so as a young mba in finance i had uh, access and exposure in in the banking world in the private banking and wealth management world in the foreign exchange world and the investment banking world now in a large company you will never know and as an mba finance i wasn't sure where so when i saw all of that uh, uh, i got a sense of where 
what clicks with me uh, and and to my mind uh, i i think that's great because when you're just out of your mba and if you have no experience then it's great to expose yourself and do everything right grind it out in the first couple of years people try and say i'm going to get the biggest job on campus and i'm going to knock it out of the park remember friends this is not a sprint it's a marathon your career is a marathon so i very clearly said i want to learn in the first 2 3 years right i want to know my game and then i'll there will time for acceleration right so um uh, that's my view right that i would like to explore learn give my value learn and give my value without value you won't go anywhere so you got to grunt it out give your value and then potentially go but yes i have to say i tried for uh, our anderson consultant accenture which is now accenture guess what four rounds of interview final interview i got rejected i got pissed off i said i don't want uh, uh, accenture and 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 you know i'm thankful to them i'm very thankful they rejected me and I, there's a different reason why they rejected if you want i'll tell you it was just the most shocking one but they played me so i went for the big because always you want a nice thappa on your thing i'm working for deloitte i'm working for kpmg and accenture and city bank and blah 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 but i started with zero uh, so i always say it's not how you start the game it's how you finish definitely uh, i i think this is also consistent with your uh, with your team that you should take risks the 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 bigger brand is a safer option so it's very i you could have easily imagine mr tarananand going for the prove yourself go for it take your chances uh, that thing or uh, one other uh, interesting question uh, in terms of uh, relationships in work and personal space do, do you have a very hard line and say these are my office colleagues i look at them from monday to friday but i don't want to go golfing with them or do you have a there is there room for interpersonal interaction in an office setting i i believe so i think you spend so much time with them uh, you know for their families i've gone everything like golf and vacations and uh, in fact we went on vacations internationally with our colleagues and we got you know we spent so much time in camaraderie we got along so well uh, and those are my best friends right now right the ones i probably did 20 years uh, you know they live by they can come into my house at any time and on so i really enjoyed my uh, colleagues and uh, built some amazing relationships so i'm not the guy who's like che baj gaye uh, sorry this is my life and that is my life i'm not i'm sure there are ours but i i think my work is my family and my life and i enjoy it yeah, yeah too i know this is not an opportunity for me to talk about what we guys do but i'm completely with him on that you spend so much time in office you it's not just the work you if you're building an organization you shoot the breeze yeah. you talk about the yeah. next cycle you talk about what we can do 5 years from now and yeah. you naturally develop deeper uh, personal relationships and and it's a lot of fun and i don't think the lines to be should be too harsh either i'm just going to i think we've covered almost all the questions and so i'm just going to uh one final question i think one or two more we still have how important is networking in today's world building a relationship your network is your net worth right huge um so you know that that discussion with uh, that picture you saw of me and mr ratan tata was exactly that so i think uh, a network can be it's worth gold uh and although i have a massive network around the world my biggest if i may say disappointment is i don't use it as much as i could and they'll do it for me it's just that just having not having the bandwidth so you know i think build your network it's huge you know it's like uh, there's a book um, dig your well before you're thirsty okay right okay. so many people call up now are i am in trouble i need your help no you got to build that relationship so when you call up it'll happen so uh, i think that's the moral um, dig your well before you're thirsty wonderful wonderful there was one question i i'm not able to place who asked it uh, there was a very interesting question on uh, what do you what is your take on um, what is going to be how the global economy is going to be like in the next in 2021 2020 let's say it's a write off it is it has been pretty much it and i don't think we're going to bounce back and do fantastic level in the final quarter but uh, what is the outlook in 2021 are we what are you factoring in and how how do you think the world will shape up so i'm not an economist so i have to put that uh, please disclaimer 
but I I am a I am optimistic. I'm a diehard optimistic. And if you want to be a CEO, you got to be an optimistic or an entrepreneur, right? So I'm hopeful because that's all you can look forward to. That there will be some form of uh, we are going to get a very bad hit, which we are all seeing. It's going to be a 10% down tick. Uh, so the economists are predicting a 8% tick. I don't know. But I think certain sectors will bounce back because of the base effect. So, uh, but I think at, from your perspective, uh, I think this is the best time to invest in a management education because, you know, today I was talking with someone from uh, Hong Kong and we were talking, what if COVID exists in 2022? And I was like, what? You know, nobody's thinking that. People are saying, when we, when we got into it, everybody said June. Then everybody said September. Now everybody's saying December. Now everybody's hoping, you know, like I'm saying, what if this damn thing continues, right? So I, I, at that point, you know that there is that scenario. But from your perspective, I can tell you, uh, this there is no better time to jump in and build your skill sets uh, in a world-class institution so that you, when the world comes out, you will join in 21. In 23, the world will be back to where it is for sure, uh, because we are a very ingenious race and we will find a cure or a solution. Uh, so uh, I'm very confident uh, that 2022 will be phenomenal. 2023 will be phenomenal. 2021 will just get back. If we get back, it's good because we've really got a bad hit and everybody around the world. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. One final question, I think, from Varun Shankar. Um, how do we go about building a network? I mean, and setting it, networking is important. Having a, a good set of relationships is important. But what are the first step towards building one? How do we put ourselves out there to build that network? So throw yourself out, right? So how did I start? Uh, any, any. Um, so whether it's your interests, right? Start with your interests, whether it's sports, whether it's your larger friend network, uh, you know, start having meaningful conversations with them, right? Uh, I'm sure you have a network of friends and so on. So at this point, just go there. Then develop interests, right? You might be developing an interest in marketing or branding or advertising or finance or banking or whatever your relative interests, so supply chain, logistics. Start putting out reading content on it. So firstly, get yourself a fantastic LinkedIn profile. Without that, don't even, you know, it's not even starting. So get yourself a LinkedIn profile and basis your interests, right? You've read something, write a few of your thoughts, right? I think this could happen in the world. This is my view. It could be right. It could be wrong. It doesn't matter. You start broadcasting your expertise in the world of the, the professional world. And there will be people who start commenting on you. No, I think this is it. Or, you know, if you talk about a company or an industry which you're passionate about. So read a lot. Put your ideas out there. People will respond and they will say, hi, huh, you made a great point. Can we get connected? You know, and that's how it starts. Or you start being uh, also, so that's one strategy, content, quality content out will get you a lot of responses and that's how you create a network. Second is you you actually, uh, in your industry, reach out to people and, and there are all, very good starts and say, you know what, I'm very interested in your profile. I'm very interesting, be complimentary. Uh, I'm interested in this industry. I'd like to learn more. Would you mind getting us connected? And then you start those conversations slowly uh, and, and you build it over time and then throw yourself out into every network you can possibly do, whether it's Rotary, whether it's sports, whether it's some other, you know, associations, just throw yourself out. You know, I had the privilege. I, I, I'm telling you, I'm gifted by the Lord and I thank him. Just uh, 15 days ago, I was speaking at the United Nations General Assembly, right? This is where presidents on the outskirts, outside of them, their presidents, I was speaking at the same with Kofi, not Kofi Annan, uh, what's the current secretary general? I should be short. I just, uh, <laughs> just left me. So, you know, again, how did I get that? I don't know. I just got an invite. Can you come and speak on, on my topic was elephants in the room, right? right? And I was like, yes. So any opportunity you get, just pounce on it. 
wonderful 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 uh, there's a follow up on the mba question so i saying uh, this i've heard too many times i've heard it a lot of times people are the students are uh, are worried about classes being heavily online and therefore missing out on campus experience so to put it very bluntly uh, there's, there's all of us are conditioned to thinking about look roi am i getting enough value in an mba if i spend a lot of time online and so fantastic question so you know i think uh, let me just take a side step what is currently industry doing you want to go into industry right finally roi industry is going to give you am i right yeah yep. roi you're going to get from industry what is industry doing today industry is working offline they are making business meetings they are doing everything from 100% from manufacturing setups they are online now you if let's say tomorrow you had a job like tomorrow like tomorrow you got a offer letter 99% of industry would say work from home but you want to say but i i don't want to learn from home but i want to i will work from home but i don't want to learn from home so for me the simple question is if there is world war 3 tomorrow i'm going to make a very very wild statement here when there is world war any any world war or a war with china or pakistan god god forbid are you going to say i'm going to stop eating are you going to say i'm going to stop drinking no right you need that nutrition for the body what food and water is for the body education is for the mind right and you are only as sharp as you can possibly be now everybody wants you in campus every business school including mine wants you in my campus can it happen no because it's a government requirement or or a, a health requirement right so in a situation if you're a business manager you say okay i want that but i can't get it because of regulation or whatever so what's the next best the next best is study from home but if you say no i want a better roi and therefore i would not study sorry you are not ceo material because in in a tough situation you've got to find the best alternative possible right and this is the best alternative possible now having said that so i'm i just set that as the base that education is not it's food for the brain you need to keep pushing yourself my team on campus i can't i mean i can't even begin to tell you how grateful i am they've just taken to a different level which wouldn't have happened from simulations to case blazers where 40 hour students are it's i mean i won't say it's 90% but it's 80% of what a 100% mba would be can i get 100% no i'm not allowed so can i take 80% yes so take it goddamn don't start thinking of this roi nonsense get the best possible solution in the given situation that's what ceos think yeah yeah wonderful wonderful i think uh, sorry i was the, being a little harsh no sorry sir we 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 need to hear that <laughs> the show goes on the show goes on we we, we make the best on. use of the show must go on we need to make the best use of what we got of course safety guidelines and norms are crucial we'll listen to all of that but we can't put a life we can't put can't pause you can't pause. pause you can't pause your life possible and possible uh with that i'm going to uh, 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 call an end to the session it was wonderful listening to you it was a fabulous i uh, would love to have more of these sessions whenever you feel free maybe once sure. every 3 4 months or once every 6 months we can jump in and and, and generally shoot the breeze just have a chance to sure. them sure. uh any final inputs words you have for people who are preparing or aspiring for their mba each other and one final question is one question just tell out was funny what is your favorite quote so maybe you can you can sign off with that the more you sweat in peace the less you bleed in war okay, okay. the harder Do you work the luckier you get the harder you work the luckier so i put in two quotes um so i i will end with that because uh, to me uh, just put in your effort and you know the results will run after you i've seen it run after you you don't have to chase the results the roi will be you can't even imagine the roi friends you can't even imagine i couldn't even put it on the on an excel spreadsheet if i had thought about it so those who focus on the roi are the ones who going to stay behind those who focus on the effort and this is what mahabharata bharata says focus on the effort leave the results they will come if you are true to your heart and true to your mind putting in your efforts nobody's going to take it away from you nobody can 
wonderful 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 uh, final words thanks a ton for uh, dropping in and uh, interacting with the students many thanks to all of you guys who who come and, and and asked wonderful questions i think we had a nice interactive session i think because the, the first part was brilliant but then the questions were uh, even juicy even spiker i enjoyed the q and a I um, did too. more than I did. I'm wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was uh, absolutely. It's good to uh, listen to the the students saying, "Look, what what do you need to do?" Very often, when we guys do, we focus so much on preparation that we don't do enough of the MBA. What what the, what are their aspirations post MBA or what do they want to take value from the MBA? Uh, many thanks. I'm going to uh, say goodbye, good night, and wonderful weekend to all of you. Have a great time. Prepare hard. Make sure that uh, give yourself a chance. This is a fabulous, fabulous exam. so uh, we have what 6 7 weeks now to throw everything into it and as he said i kept one thing that is common through everything you said is that the input variable is in your hands throw tons of effort into whatever you do uh, and uh, may the force be with you best wishes guys cheers and, and good day good weekend bye, bye.